Hi, welcome to uh, Chapter 14, Section 3. We're going to be talking about women in the economy all the way through market revolutions. So we're talking about the industrialization, the early industrialization of America, mainly in the textile industries in New England. Uh, so we're going to be talking about women today in the economy and their role at that time. We're talking pre-Civil War, uh, antebellum America, everyone talking about the South, uh, but mainly pre-Civil War, you know, New England. Um, factory girls were girls that um, filled the ranks of the textile mills. They, they toiled for six days a week um, for very low pay. They were mistreated um, and just not really well respected. But for a single gal, that was a, a way to make a little bit of money and hopefully make a, you know make a little bit of a living before finding a man and marrying off. Uh, there were strict rules and, and guidelines and, and grueling conditions. Uh, that, that really kind of restricted these these young girls working in the factories. Uh, women were forbidden to form unions. They weren't allowed to work together. Uh, some people urged women and kind of fought for them. Uh, one of them was Catherine Beecher, uh, who urged women to enter the teaching profession. You know, it was a nurturing profession. It was very similar to being a mother. Uh, so it went, it went well with the supposed natural qualities of a woman uh, that were perceived in the 1800s. Uh, a vast majority of the women that were working were single because a woman, uh, if she was married, had a duty to her husband at home at that time. Uh, and then if she was a mother, absolutely had a duty to her children. That was her most important role and job that a woman could do um, back in this time period. Most had to leave their jobs upon marriage. Um, and you have this cult of domesticity. Uh, which is a widespread cultural creed that glorified the customary functions of a homemaker. Cooking, cleaning, child rearing, all those things uh, were, were celebrated, uh, and they were what women did. It was the realm of the woman, uh, and it was her job, it was her place in society. This cult of domesticity, uh, we still have many remnants of it today. It's been hard to shake off. Um, it, it was very, very powerfully ingrained in our nation's history, in our culture, and in our psyche. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, families were small, uh, they were affectionate, um, they were child-centered, uh, which provided a special place for women. We're talking about industrial families, city families. It's a little different than rural areas where, um, you know, having lots of children uh, helped out because you had, you know, more workers to help you out. Uh, birth rate dropped you know, in these places, in the industrialized places because of domestic feminism. Uh, they wanted, you know, basically to uh, have a little bit of time for themselves. And so, you know, birth rates dropped uh, for those who were living in the cities. Children were shaped uh, in America, not broken like in Europe. Um, Americans were taught to be individuals, uh, to think for themselves, to do things for themselves. And they were shaped and they were encouraged to do these things. And Many Europeans came here and thought that American children were just vile and uh, just poorly behaved. So you children out there, keep behaving the way you are. You're being a good American. So Western farmers reaped the revolution in the fields. We're going to go back to technology a little bit here. In the Trans-Allegheny region, especially Indiana and Illinois, it became the nation's breadbasket at that time. That was where most of the crops uh, for the country were being grown and to feed these eastern cities. Liquor and hogs became what every early western farmers staple market items because both of these items were supported by corn. Um, you could make liquor out of corn, you could feed your hogs with corn, and you know what, you can, they were very profitable. I think there's some old country song, or not even an old one, a new one, corn makes whiskey, or rain makes corn, corn makes whiskey. It's terrible. Stop listening to it. Country music causes cancer. Just don't do it. Uh, John Deere, yes, that John Deere that people wear, the, the clothes still around today and have tractors and all that, uh, produced a steel tip plow in 1837, which broke through the thick soil of the American West, especially once they get onto the Great Plains with the thick sod. Uh, and, and, you know, when they get out there, they had to go much, much deeper into the soil for some dry farming techniques. Uh, other inventions that helped farmers with the, was the McCormick Reaper, which is a horse-drawn mechanical reaper that cut and gathered crops much faster than previous methods, using a scythe or a sickle and doing it by hand. The mechanical reaper, which sounds like a medieval torture device or a really bad Swedish heavy metal band, I'm not sure, 
uh, to increase the production of farmers, uh, and basically they could produce, they could, they could, you know, harvest more acres of crops and sell more for profit. So it enabled larger scale farming, uh, and because of this, subsistence farming, which is where you just farm just enough to, you know, feed your family and maybe sell a little bit at the farmer's market, uh, gave way to food production, which is where you're making, uh, you're growing crops to make a profit. Uh, but more reliable transportation was needed still. Um, so the potential for large commercial farms is there. Not really there to ship all the stuff back to the east yet. So here's a picture of the mechanical reaper. Looks like they're doing some, some cutting some, some, some wheat there. Um, here's some factories in the north. Uh, this is actually the mechanical reaper works in the 1850s. Uh, showing the hectic uh, nature of mass production versus the slow backwards ways of living on the farms. So in terms of transportation, the Lancaster Turnpike was a hard surfaced highway that ran from Philadelphia to Lancaster, Philadelphia. Uh, drivers had to pay a toll to use it, but it was one of the best roads in America. It was, it was hard surface, it didn't run out, it wasn't as muddy and dusty. Uh, and it was well worth the money if you were trying to get from Philadelphia to the western parts of Pennsylvania to Lancaster quickly. In 1811, the first federal, the federal government began to construct the first national road or the Cumberland Road. Uh, because of the War of 1812 and because of some delays, uh, it, it took a while to finish. It went from Cumberland in western Maryland all the way to Illinois. Uh, construction was halted for the war. Uh, and it was finally finished nearly 28 years later in 1839. Uh, but once again, opening up more and more of the West, allowing people to travel easier, allowing products to be uh, shipped easier, uh, raw materials from the West back to the East, and finished goods from the East back to the West. Uh, it was also expanded from Baltimore to St. Louis in 1852. Uh, I believe it goes on the path of what is today I-70. Robert Fulton uh, installed a steam engine on a boat and thus created the first steamboat, the Claremont, in 1807. Here's a little picture of it. Uh, instead of using manpower or wind power or whatever kind of power you wanted, you could use steam power and go up and down the rivers and up and down the coast much, much easier, much, much quicker. Uh, the steamboat played a vital role in the economic expansion of the West and the South. Because of the extensive waterways, the Ohio, the Missouri, and most importantly, the Mississippi, uh, shipping could be done down the Mississippi very easily, but now because of the steamboat, they could also ship things back up the Mississippi, uh, which enabled two-way trade and really kind of opened things up for more settlement in the West. Uh, but in 1820, there were only 60 steamboats on the Mississippi. By 1860, they were in the thousands. They become a part of American lore, American culture. Um, we have the great author Mark Twain, who got his name from working on a steamboat. His real name is Samuel Clemens, uh, and they become, like I said, a part of our fabric of, of America back then. Here's a here's a map that shows the Lancaster Turnpike. You can see it wasn't very long, but it was a really well built road. Uh, and then the Cumberland Road, uh, the red was where it originally started from Cumberland all the way to Illinois, so it's stopping in Ven Vandalia. Uh, finished in 1839, and then they expanded it all the way to Baltimore to St. Louis uh, by 1852. Here's some steamboats in the old south there. Reminds you of something from Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer, it looks like, or I don't know, going riverboat gambling. Never been on one, so I'm not sure. Maybe you southerners can, can comment on it and help me out. Uh, the next kind of thing that, that kind of came up was... Uh, canals, which is really essentially a big giant ditch with locks and interlock, basically bathtubs and stuff like that. Uh, governor DeWitt Clinton, the governor of New York, uh, was the guy who led the building of the Erie Canal. The dream was that if you could connect the Hudson River to the Great Lakes, uh, it could connect New York City commercially to the Great Lakes region, to some of these growing places for factories uh, like Cleveland, Detroit, eventually Chicago. Um, and so it connected the Great Lakes with the Hudson River, which connected to New York City. The canal lowered shipping prices, it decreased passenger transit time, uh, and it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, you know, innovation, especially for the growth of New York City. Uh, it took 363 miles of this giant ditch to dig with a series of locks to raise and lower boats based on you know, adding or subtracting water from these locks. 
It was open on October 26, 1825, but they didn't plan ahead very well. It wasn't designed to help. It wasn't designed to withstand steamboats. It was just, you know, they were going to pull up these boats with horses, basically. And so they had to go pack and fix it uh, shortly after this and reinforce the wall so steamboats could go up and down the Erie Canal. Uh, this sparked a canal booming, a building boom across the country. Pretty soon everyone's digging giant ditches back and forth, uh, connecting bodies of water uh, and to enable more and more shipping. By 1850, there was 3,600 miles of canals in the United States of America. Yay, canals. When, later, we're going to build one in Panama. We'll talk about that later. Um, here's some of the, the bluer the canals, the greener are navigable rivers. Uh, and the purple shows that there's not a lot of roads going on. Um, and so rivers were more and more reliable. They were quicker, especially when you're going downstream. Uh, and the canals kind of helped fill in the gaps to this westward movement. Yay. The most significant contribution though, the expansion of the American economy to the American transportation was the invention of the railroad. No other industry had effects on the rest of the country like the railroad in the 1800s. The only thing that comes closest in the 1900s is the automobile. Uh, the railroad changes our country, changes our culture. Um, it becomes the backbone of the United States during the 1800s. The first ones appeared in, in 1828 in the United States. On the eve of the Civil War, we had over 30,000 miles of track. Uh, you can see in the map here, from uh, everything in blue is what we had in 1850. And between in the 10 years leading up to the Civil War, from 1850 to 1860, there was a railroad building boom, uh, predominantly in the north. Two-thirds of the railroads would be in the north, which greatly helped eventually the Union armies to transport goods, men, supplies, you name it, uh, to the battlefront, and they were more mobile than those southern counterparts. Three-fourths of them, I said two-thirds, I'm sorry, were in the north. Railroads were initially opposed because of safety flaws, and they took away money from the Erie Canal and all these other investors, but people real realized that, man, the train's a lot faster, it's easier to construct, it's cheaper, uh, and, and it was just a, a better product. And so railroads... We'll come back to this when we'll we talking about the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, they are essential to the United States at that time. Uh, here's an old Baltimore and Susquehanna. Susquehanna, sorry, I'm not from the Pennsylvania Railroad there. Now are now running. Look at that. Wow. Baltimore to Wrightsville. Get on the train. Let's go. Um, other things. Because of the telegraph, um, Cyrus Field, after a couple attempts, laid the first transatlantic cable. Basically, the United States was wired to Europe through the telegraph, and we could get instant news from Europe, and they could get news from us uh, through this electricity. Uh, these electrical impulses, it was really a marvel. It just seemed to shrink the world. Uh, and so we weren't so behind. It would have been useful in the War of 1812. Could have avoided the war with the British. Could have avoided the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, but it's a little bit late. The permanent one, they had a temporary one. There was a permanent one laid uh, in 1866. In the 1840s and 50s, American naval yards began to produce new ships. American innovations in ships uh, produced things called clipper ships because they clipped the time it took to sail across the Atlantic by a matter of days. They're much more, uh, they're, they're sleeker, they, they're faster, they have a lot of small sails, and they just were a much faster ship. They sacrificed precious cargo room for speed. They were able to transport small amounts of goods in short amounts of time. Uh, and so the kind of the express way to get across the Atlantic were, were these clipper ships. These ships were eventually superseded by steamboats. Uh, after steamboats were improved, eventually steamboats were replaced by diesel engines, um, which is still predominantly used today, although we do have nuclear-powered submarines. Nuclear. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the famed and short-lived Pony Express uh, series of stops of, of horse riders and horses and, and stables to basically get a, a letter from, oh, St. Joseph, Missouri, all the way to California in a matter of days. Uh, people are infatuated with the Pony Express, even though it doesn't really do much. It only lasts 18 months uh, because of a lack of profit. But it was really an ambitious plan, and, and it really captured the imaginations of the United States, of the Americans, uh, just kind of represented what the Old West was. 
here's a picture of a clipper ship. Go LA Clippers, I guess. You're named after a boat. It's all right. My team's named after a hunk of gold, a rock, a nugget, not chicken nuggets. Um, and then the transport web binds the union. The transportation revolution was created because people in the east wanted to go west. People in the west wanted stuff from the east. And people from the west wanted the ship stuff to the east. And people from the east wanted the ship their stuff to the west. And so, hey, let's build some stuff that makes it easy. Canals and railroads were allowed unnatural movement of goods. You didn't have to follow the rivers. You didn't have to follow the passes. You could go where you pleased. It's not total freedom, you know, like cars. You basically drive where you want. But it really allowed Americans to do uh, a lot of different things, to go places they wanted to go. Uh, Buffalo handled more Western products than New Orleans by, 18, by the 1840s because of railroads, uh, because of the canals. Western farmers were shipping stuff to Buffalo more than New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans was a flashpoint with the Spanish. We, that's why we had the, the adams Onish Treaty was to basically open up New Orleans. But by the 1840s, eh, we can go to Buffalo. And while you're there, get some chicken wings because they're delicious. Uh, the South raised cotton uh, for export to New England and Britain, and they shipped it down the Mississippi uh, to New Orleans, and then they shipped it up to those textile factories in New England. The West grew grain and livestock to feed the factory workers in the East and in Europe. And the East made machines and textiles for the South and the West. And so you have triangle trade. Hey, here in the United States, you have each one kind of doing their own thing, working together. And that whole notion of triangle trade that was in pre-colonial or pre-United pre States, pre-Declaration of Independence, uh, United States, we, we have it within the United States, this triangle trade. All these products were transported using the railroad. And the railroad brought our country together. Thank you, Choo Choo. Choo Choo. So here's uh, some trails going out west. You can see the purple is the Pony, the Pony Express. Oh, people love that Pony Express. Eventually, we're going to talk about the Oregon Trail and the old Spanish Trail and the Santa Fe Trail and the Butterfield Trail and Trail Mix, whatever. Uh, and then finally, the market revolution. Uh, the market revolution transformed the American economy from one of where people subsisted on things they grew or created, where they were self-sufficient to one where you went and bought stuff. Uh, and things were produced all over the country, and they were shipped, and you went to the store and bought it. And so as we became more civilized and more urbanized, people simply went and bought things. Uh, it led to greater wealth, uh, inequity, especially in the cities, but uh, wages for unskilled workers rose 1% per year from 1820 to 1860, that's pretty low. At the same time, the standard of living for the United States, for Americans, was growing steadily. Americans could buy more stuff. Uh, eventually, by the 1950s, we had the highest standard of living in the world. You can buy more stuff for your money in America at that time than any other place. And it all started with, you know, technology, transportation, factories. And instead of making your own soap, go to the store and buy it. It's just a lot easier. So here's a kind of little map, an economic map, showed what everyone was doing at this time. Uh, really not anyone out in the Great Plains or the Rocky Mountains yet, but I got a little things going on. Um, that's our economy. Here's a little timeline and some practice questions if you like. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. Uh, otherwise, have a good evening.